Welcome to On the Brink, a fresh lens to take you and your business to new heights. Hi, I'm Andy Simon. I'm your host and your guide. And as you know, my job is to get you off the brink. It's not good to be stuck there. Stalling is not happy. Whether it's personal or professional, your corporation, your company, your small business, or yourself. So our job is to help you see, feel, and think in new ways so you can do things differently. And that's what I'm all about. You know, I'm a corporate anthropologist and I love to help people change, but it's painful. So I go looking for people who can help you do just that. Today, I have with me Kathy D'Agostino, who is a terrific woman who's going to help you see, feel, and think in new ways, because that's exactly what she has done with her career and her business. Let me tell you a little bit about Kathy, and then she'll tell you more about herself. She's an executive coach and business consultant. She has 25 plus years of experience helping leaders grow both their business and invest in their greatest asset, their employees. Today, this is a big topic because the employees are hard to attract, you know, the big gaps and they're hard to retain and they're all finding new ways to do things. She's worked with hundreds of organizations to develop their leadership teams, accentuate core values and create a strong culture. Her client base is diverse, global, pharma, pharma companies, professional service firms, education, nonprofits, Before she formed Win at Business Coaching, Kathy held senior level positions for global organizations where she was responsible for turning around underperforming sales teams, driving revenue growth in declining markets and building game-changing customer service programs. So I have somebody who had a corporate experience, who's now an independent, a coach with a great business. Kathy, thank you for joining me today. Oh, I'm so glad to be here. Thank you for inviting me, Andrea. Well, it's been a pleasure to get to know you a bit. Tell the listener or the audience or the viewer, however you're watching or listening to us, who is Kathy? What was your journey like? And then we'll go into this big problem for today, the great resignation. And then, okay, I resign. Now what do I do? So please, Kathy, <laughs> who is Kathy? So, Andrew, you're quite interesting, the great resignation, because I actually was a little ahead of the curve. I guess I was a trailblazer, as many of us were, but it wasn't quite as visible in public. Um, About seven years ago, I quit my corporate job after 25 years, as you read in the bio. And um, I really decided, you know, that I'd been thinking about it for a while. And then, like, probably waited a little too long because I made a pretty, I made a pretty snap decision. So, What I did is one January, after having some time off and reflection, I called the gentleman that I work with. I have a problem with boss. I just like to say we work. I I work for him. Um, (laughs) So I work for him probably why I'm not in corporate anymore, right? (laughs) Um, So I and I called him and I said, "Look, it's January. I have this opportunity of a lifetime to take two weeks vacation," and he said to me, "You're crazy. It's only January. You're going to use your vacation up because I just started the job." a year ago and he said like that doesn't make business sense and he said we have a big project coming up I'm like oh I totally understand oh he said it was going to cause a lot of problems for his boss and I'm like I would never want to do that for you so I said you know it doesn't even make common sense I totally agree with you I understand that um because to me I said it makes sense so I said here's what I can do I said I can send you an email with the resignation or I could send you a vacation request for two weeks. I said, you know, it's up to you. And he goes, well, how long do I decide? And I'm like, oh, I don't leave for three weeks. Just let me know before that. I'm glad to send either email. (laughs) Oh my God. I wish I had a recording of his voice. (laughs) And so about a day later, he called back and he said, I'll take the email for the, you know, for the vacation request. I'm like, awesome. He said, you'll come back relaxed and rested. We have a big project on the schedule. I'm like, absolutely. So take the vacation, come back, finish the project two months later. And like, I guess the beginning of April and I resigned. Um, So I use that time for reflection and we'll talk about that more at the end, what people can do. Um, That was my, that was my, and then I got home in April and I said, oh my God, what am I going to (laughs) do? All the freedom and flexibility I was looking for, I had. And I'm like, now what do I do? I'm so used to having this reporting structure and people, you know, and now you're free. Oh, well, be careful what you ask for. (laughs) But you know, this is not an inconsequential life journey for us because I remember um, I decided to leave corporate after 20 years helping organizations as an executive change. And, and I really didn't have anything propelling me. 
except 9-11. And I had that aha moment, which said, if I'm going to go into my own business, it's not a bad time to do that. I had to go find a PR guy who I had worked with a great deal and said, who am I? And it was fun to listen to him say, you're a corporate anthropologist that helps companies change. I said, bingo, in a capsule. Does anyone know way back 20 years ago, if anyone was looking for a corporate anthropologist, it didn't matter. So it's a very, I knew I could help companies change, but how? So how did you end up becoming this kind of coach that you are today? What kind of coach are you? What did you finally decide on? So I decided um, to do executive coaching. And I've had a transitional period where, you know, I kind of had my niche and didn't find it. But what I really thought back after about two years of really looking through and working with small business owners and whatever, I really said, what was what made me leave? What was the impact that I needed to make? And it was really on culture because the companies that I quit were bad bosses or because companies had you know, didn't live their values. And for me, it's all about integrity. And I think a lot of employees. So to me, I really thought about what was it that was made the biggest impact. And it was really creating better workplaces for employees so that they stay. I thought, you know, the retention's always been um, a challenge for really good employees. And I just really felt that um, it was all about that culture because if I, I would take less money, to work in a company where the culture felt right to me and my values felt like line versus one where I can make a lot of money and I felt like I was selling my soul. Kathy, you had experience learning how to do this though when you were in corporate, am I correct? So, I mean, um, you mean, so I'm not sure I understand. So when you were in corporate, the kinds of work that you were doing had to do with building better cultures, correct? And it was yeah. a different way of learning on the job it's not a, you know, it's not, you're not an academic, but you certainly had huge credentials while you were developing these perspectives and skills. Am I correct? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I know what you mean by now. So when I really looked even deeper, I'm like, what really drove me to, you know, to make this, to be so like, so um, passionate about, you know, these great companies and these better cultures. And it was when I was managing sales teams and I could develop those people. So while I realized maybe the company culture wasn't exactly in alignment with what I was, I could align my team with what those values were. And that with that experience alone was really, really valuable. Now I had a manager at that time because I had to come in and fire a number of people when I had taken over this role. And she said, oh, you'll be jaded by this forever. And I think I'd like to reframe her and say, no, I was driven by that, yes. um, where I had to change that team because they had a manager there for 25 years that liked to coast a little bit, you know? And I came in and I'm like, oh, this isn't the way we work. So I wanted to create my own culture within this team, even though I had the external culture, my higher ups. Um, and I had the ability to do that. And that's well, really what made me think about what was so important. What I love about that story though, is that, um, it's going to jade you, it's going to drive you. Isn't it interesting perspective? You know, on one hand, you were anticipating being frustrated by this. And for you, it was that, you, I love it because we do the same thing. It's this vacuum where I have people who are underperforming. They're sort of just, you know, attending. And now can I demonstrate that they can rise? This is so exciting. So as you've launched your business now, moving out of the small business world into culture, talk to us about what you do and how you do it and for whom. So, you know, again, as the bio said, it is diverse, but lately it's been at, as of, you know, like you mentioned 9-11, pivotal moment in the world that's been the pandemic. So, you know, looking once again at these pivotal moments, um, the organizations in the last year and a half have changed that I'm working with. I mean, some, some stayed, but one of the things that's really been important is the government. Uh, I work with a, a number of local government agencies and because they have constraints of unions and civil service to promote their people, they have some unique challenges. Um, so working with some of them, and they have huge departments of around 1,100 people. So when you see that group of people, and even the executive team, some are on the um, are in the union, and some are non-union. So there's all of these 
things that you have to manage in addition to culture and making change in those organizations have been really impactful. And luckily they got some pandemic money. So that's actually allowed them to bring me back because I worked with them a little bit before and now even more so. Nonprofits are definitely another one that, you know, they're struggling. There's so many people asking for money. So nonprofits, I work with a number of them and I'm on a board for one. So I really am passionate about the work that they do. Um, and then interestingly enough, Several of my executive clients that I work with through corporate called me during the pandemic and said, you know what, I don't want to make that three hour drive. I don't want to be on the train anymore. I had time to rethink my life. I like working from home. Like I need to rethink my career and more manage it than, you know, thinking about like making like just staying because oh, tomorrow to get better. Um, I need to think about what I really want. And those, so the, the blend of those two, which is interesting because I have the corporate side or the organization side, but then I have the employee perspective. So just a case in point, I have an employee, a, a woman that I'm speaking with this morning, right after this, actually it's afternoon, I guess it'll be afternoon. And she's been with a company only a year and a half, very, um, very top graduate from one of the top business schools. She's in a top company and she's unhappy. She's there 16 months and she has up her early promotion and she's like, I'm bored. Like, I think I should leave. <laughs> Just, I mean, so it's a cry. It was executives that have been there mid, usually mid career. Yeah. And then this young one, it says like 16 months, I'm going to get this promotion. Eh, I don't know if it means enough to me to stay. <laughs> okay. Don't lose that because um, this is an excellent case study about, I have a bunch of 29 year olds who came out of uh, universities, colleges with good degrees, been working in the same place for a period of time. Is that all there is? It isn't even a promotion or not a promotion. Is I'm, I, I'm unhappy, but I don't even know what will make me happy. And that's the, that's the coaching challenge because I can't make them happy. Um, but, no. <laughs> but and, and for yours, it's a real interesting aha moment because she came in with lots of hoopla, I'm sure, and they were excited to bring her in. And now the question is for the company and for the individual, what are we missing here? A woman too, which I think is a real important thing because they need purpose. They don't need just a position or a salary. And that's just what she's saying. What's my purpose? What do you see? Very, you know, very much so. What's interesting too is because she's been a, a, a high achiever all of her life. She's been getting kudos and kudos. Now she's gotten this organization where there's a lot of other people that are very similar to her. So they're <laughs> bright, they're fast, they're quick. And she's going like, but I should be put first. And so I think what I'm seeing a little bit, and I, this is a little off topic, but I think a little emotional intelligence. She's got the IQ off the chart on the IQ. She's got the you know work ethic, but I think a little bit more, she has the attitude, and I, I know you'll recognize this, the WIIFM, you know, what's in it for me. And she wants to go to the corporation and tell them like this job, what's in it for me. And I think I want to see if she's willing to say, can I bring my talents and how can I best serve you? Yes. A little bit of a different statement yes. than I think, I, yeah, I think I have more, to, yeah, I think I have more to offer. How about, let's say, what are you working on that I could help you <laughs> with? Yes. So I think a little emotional intelligence there. I'm seeing a little of that, you know, maybe, insightfulness and self-awareness and emp empathy. You know, but I do think the executive coaches, coaching clients I have, I have almost all women. They're so different than the men because the men are talking about careers as a ladder to climb. And the women have often reached, I have one woman who's wonderful. She's an MBA, a CPA. She's a partner in an accounting firm and she never wants to do another tax return. And I have another I one <laughs> who is a very successful wealth manager and, and is, is, uh, it's, not, it's necessary, but not sufficient. And they see their lives broader. And it isn't just being on a not-for-profit board or you know, helping children, which is often a, a way of complementing the business. But this is a sense of who am I? What's my purpose? And it's a bigger question about where do I get my self-fulfilling happiness from? Um, it's, but, it, but they're asking it in a way which makes the coaching uh, situation very rich because they are the only ones who can discover that. And it's all that story in their head about who they are and what they were aspiring to. But this kind of yours is another illustration of, of how, do I how do I change the story from I'm the hero to I would like to be part of the team. How do I play better? And she's a heroine, isn't she? 
she is and and you know she wants to let everybody know that and 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 you and I know maybe with age and wisdom or just I'll put that I'll put wisdom sorry <laughs> um you know that we don't have to be the smartest person in the room and if you know if we are maybe we're in the wrong room right so you know how can we put ourselves in in places where we're challenged and where it gives us opportunities to say hey I, I'm I'm here to be a part of the team I want my purpose and mission but you know fulfilled and I think yeah, and I think though when they can really align with the company, um, Andy, when they're I, and I really I challenge her to look at what's the purpose and the vision of the company and does it align with her own? Exactly. That that to me, then you know what? Then it's not what's in it for me. It's you know fear of missing out that I'm going to be part of this big organization and this wonderful change that I could actually be a part of, not be you know you know be the the change. You know. Uh, yeah, I see. No, Kathy. I should think about this in the context of the great resignation, the illustrations I love because I'm a storyteller like you are, and they, they make the abstraction come alive, but there's no shortage of research about what people are thinking about and what they're doing. And this great resignation at a time when it seems so hard to find people to work in the jobs that you have. Um, any insights you can bring to our listeners about what to think about if you're thinking about resigning or what do you see happening? Thoughts? Yeah. So two ways I'm going to look at that for you. One, I can tell you um, what I'm hearing from the employees and direct directly and what I can, you know, the research will tell us, right? So the research will tell us that people really want growth opportunities. And like this girl, right, you know, that they really wanted training, they want to develop and they want to grow. And when co companies don't offer them that opportunity, um, they, they will quit oftentimes bad bosses and, and and bad bosses are the ones that often don't see the potential in them and don't give them the opportunity. So I think that that is really key to, um, you know, actually to what we do, like coaching and training, right? So that's what like, you know, I run um, a lot of training classes on leadership. And, and when companies invest in that, you know, they have an 87% higher retention rate. That is huge considering, I think in, um, I have October, this actually last month, October 2, 2021, 4.3 million people walked out of their jobs. Some of them went to other jobs and some of them just resigned to do something else, which I'll answer in a second for you. Yeah. But that's almost 3%, 3% of the workforce. I mean, when you have that, you know, we really have to say, what's it going to take to keep people and what do people really want? And that's the one thing I hear. Uh, they want to raise. Absolutely. People would always work for more money. <laughs> you know, you feel more excited. We all feel more excited. We get a client that, you know, like wants to really reward us for the work that we do. So they want that, you know, some of them, of course, this um, flexible work balance life, you know, I don't call it a balance. I call it an integration where we can actually, you know, where we actually feel like our job and our home life has a certain way of intersecting we're not living two different worlds and we can do that and i think the key to that has been why people have been walking out the door because they can't get that integration right the company says no no 24 7 you're on call and they're saying but i work from home i could do this other schedule be really productive see my kids a little more right so um that that's the one thing i think companies can do and people can think about in their own minds those are the things that other employees are saying they really want in terms of if you're really thinking like you've made up your mind like I did, and it took me, you know, a couple of years of thinking, um, I thinking about the problem. And you know what, Andrea, when I switched to thinking about the solutions, when I changed my, and we know I'm coaching, right? When we change our thoughts and the neuroplasticity and all those other things, we can rewire our brain to think, what are the solutions? And as coaches, that's what we do. It's like, okay, here's the problem. We could talk about that for five hours. Okay, we know it exists. Let's talk about the solution. So when people start thinking about what are the solutions? Okay, quitting is one of them. Yeah. Maybe, you know, talking about getting some, another promotion before I leave, making a plan, um, you know, really concrete, specific things. One of the things that happened for me is very fortunately, and I know you know if I say the name, um, I was out for a walk and, and this person joined me and I said, you know, I'm really thinking about leaving. Matter of fact, someday is not a day on the calendar anymore. So that <laughs> someday is today and or, you know, coming up. And I'm like, you know, what do you think? And pretty much the same as for you, Andrea. She's looked at me and she said, you've worked with so many different types of businesses and from like national movie studios to the mom and pops. And she said, a business executive coach, what else would you do? And I'm like, <laughs> oh, of course, what else would I do? She said, having that business acumen and that understanding and then knowing how the employees feel having had teams, she said, like, 
was there anything else you were thinking about? <laughs> I'm like, no, absolutely not. Matter of fact, glad you confirmed that for me. So I think that's what people talk to other people, talk to people who've done it, talk to people who decided to stay. Yes. Um, we have something like 50% of the people in the last 20 months saying that they are going to quit their jobs or thinking about quitting their jobs. They, you know, not ready to do it yet, uh, thinking about it. So if they're thinking about it, that means they're spending half of their time with their foot out the door yep. and only half of their time engaged. We know when employees are engaged, companies are actually, I think the statistic, Andrea, is 2.5% more profitable. I heard up as high as 19% more profitable. So if you have somebody only giving 50% and they, and they could give 100, um, what does that say to us that, yeah. you know, we have to either, we have to eventually set some timelines. What's the difference between a dream and a, and a goal? Having a timeline, right? Set some timelines, some milestones, talk to people. And I think really think it through what's in your heart and, um, and, and how can you start looking for solutions? What are, you know, what are the solutions? I didn't know I could make an earning a living, you know, outside of that. But Andrea, quick story short, I think I've always been an entrepreneur. When I, an entrepreneur. When I was 10, my sister and I took babysitting jobs. She took one side of the street. I took the other side. Nobody got in there because we babysat for each other. <laughs> you know, I, when we were really little, there was a little craft store down the street. We'd make all the crafts and get out and take them. They'd give us whatever they'd give us. But, you know, always thinking about that, you know. Um, and when I look back and I say, oh, my gosh, I always had this entrepreneurial spirit. So entrepreneurial and so when I got into my own I think when I was coaching the sales teams I could do that again yes. and so to me you know it's kind of like here's where the story goes <laughs> well but that's it's great and and what you do for people is help them literally what we're talking about today see feel and think in new ways mm -hmm. just that just as what what the catalytic moments are today but I, I have two thoughts and then we'll do our wrap up my first thought is that the companies are missing the point and I do think that the point is that work has changed. The meaning of work has changed. The pandemic has made us very aware that um, this work-life balance is not true. Is it work-life and life-work? I mean, this is to your point. I like that feeling of blending. And, you know, we do need to make a living, but do we have to do it at the exclusion of life? I was doing a talk for Republic National Distribution, a large uh, deliver, distribu distributor of liquor. And I interviewed many of their folks who spent their lives on airplanes like I had done. And, and they said, this has been a mind blower for me because I used to go on a plane on Monday, come back on Thursday, work on the company on Friday, maybe spend a half a day on Saturday on work, maybe a day with my kids. And now I've learned that there's life. And my business is up 234%. So what is that telling me? So if you can measure, you know, what you can, what you can live, you can begin to see that what I was doing wasn't necessarily the path to growth. It was just a job, the way it was defined. So companies need to rethink what is work and what is it I want and, and begin to treat your employees as part of the discussion, not as an afterthought. They are not to be done to, they are to be done with. As you said, you didn't really work for him, you worked with him. And in some ways, you could go back to him and say, why don't you hire me as a consultant? Because I can do it for you, but I can do it faster and easier as an independent than within the confines. Of course, that threatens their own job, but it's another conversation. <laughs> but I have a right. for the folks who are thinking of resigning, um, the, particularly women and a lot of women of color, the number of, of those folks who have started their own business, either as a side hustle or as a full-time career job, are, are just enormous. But the number who close and fail every day is disturbing. So if you're going to do this, spend a little time ahead of time thinking through what this is so that you don't find yourself out the door with nothing but hope. And hope is not a good strategy, as I say so often. For whether it's a company or a purpose, you need more than just a, a someday, you know, a dream. You need a plan and, and you need to, you talked about growing as you went forward. It's not a place that you're, that's a destination, it's a journey. So with that in mind, two or three things you want our listeners to remember, because this has been a kind of conversation I just love for them to hear. It's all about how do I change? And if you're ready to think about it, we're ready to help you. Tell us a couple of things not to forget. So I think it's really important to, you know, if you're in a job right now, like explore the options within the organization. And if you've really made that decision that it's time to go, 
you know, hit the pause button and do some planning. Talk to people that have left, as I mentioned before. Talk to people who you trust, mentors. Have you had a past mentor? Can they tell you, what do I do really well? What's my superpower? Yeah. You know, really ask that question. Um, I think ask people, this, this is a specific question. Uh, Tony Robbins used this one and, and grew his empower. And it was really, tell me two things that you think I do really well in this world or in this community or in life. And then tell me the one thing you think I could really improve upon. Um, and, that, and that really does, that really gives a lot of insights into it. I think take your time, make it a smart decision. Again, based on economics, you know, I, when I did it at a point, money wasn't a big issue because, you know, obviously it worked a long time in my career. So, you know, if money's a factor, you know, plan on you could fail or it could take you, a, it took me a lot longer, it took me easily 24 months before I realized a profit, you know, because there's so much expense. So can you really Con consult your accountant, whatever it is, whatever it is, put a plan, put milestones, put things in place, talk to people, ask them questions. And, um, and, and I want to say follow your heart, everybody says that, but I mean, what's true to you? Like, what are your values? Really identify your values and identify what are your must haves. People want to focus on, I don't want this in the organization. I don't want that. And focus on your, again, that thinking to the solutions. What's my must haves? And then go after those. And believe it or not, that vision Every day, that vision will drive you to the right place. That's not to be inconsequential here. That's important. You have a story in your head today. In that story, you know the things that are irritating. But what won't irritate you is missing. And I find as I work with people to or their organizations to change, defining what will make them happy is more difficult than being angry at what's making them unhappy. And that is not inconsequential for all of you listening or watching. So if you're going to think about this as a better way for you, you better be clear that if it's a fuzzy, that's okay. But if it doesn't exist at all, you're in trouble because then you're going to stop work and you're going to say, now what do I do? And you won't even know what are those two things I'm really good at. And one thing you wish I did better. Great conversation today, Kathy. Thank you so much. Thank so, you, Andrea. <laughs> oh, Kathy, one last thing. Where can they reach you? Is LinkedIn the best place or something else? LinkedIn is absolutely my favorite place to connect with people. Um, at the end of the blog, Andrea, you include all my information. So my emails and all that's there as well. Um, I'd love to hear from you if I can help any time. I'm always glad to have that conversation. Kathy has a lovely website as well. And we'll put all that information together for you. So let's wrap up. It's been a great time to talk about how do you get off the brink? Thanks for joining us today. And remember, I have two books out there for you to do just this. On the Brink, A Fresh Lens to Take Your Business to New Heights is all about companies that have been stuck or stalled that we help see, feel, and think in new ways. Yours could be one of those for the next book. And then Rethink that just came out this year. Rethink is Smashing the Myths of Women in Business. It's stories about 11 women, including my own, who, unlike the women that Kathy and I are struggling with, knew what they wanted to be. And they didn't let anything stop them. And so it doesn't matter whether you're an attorney who was told not to be one or an entrepreneur or a geoscientist, you're going to read about women who were able to smash through the myths that were holding them back and become the best they could be. Interesting, compared to often my male clients, these women never thought about position or power. They thought about becoming and purpose. And even if they became really successful in whatever career they were, it was always about becoming, it was what was interesting to them. And it didn't matter whether it was earth st studies or the law or building a business, it was a conversation about purpose. And I do think that that's where we're at today. So thank you all for coming. Send me your ideas. I'd love to hear about them. I'd love to hear who you'd like to hear from. And I thank Kathy for being us with us today. Thank you, Kathy D'Agostino. It's been a Thank pleasure. you again, Andrea. We're signing off. Please stay well. Bye-bye now.